Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. Tonight our focus is clinical trials. Our panel of speakers will talk about how clinical trials contribute to the development of treatment for symptoms of Fragile X syndrome, what the practicalities are for families involved in a clinical trial, and what trials are on the horizon here in Australia. The presentations will be followed by Q&A. On behalf of Fragile X Association of Australia, I would like to thank Zynerba Pharmaceuticals for supporting this event through an educational grant. Before I introduce our speakers, a little bit of housekeeping. Part of this webinar tonight will be recorded. The presentations will be recorded and uploaded to our website for replay. The Q&A session will not be though, for privacy reasons. During the presentations, all participants' microphones will be switched off, but during the Q&A session, you'll be able to switch your audio and video back on. We're very keen to have questions at the end of the sessions. You can type your questions into the chat box and we'll go through them during the Q&A, or during the Q&A, raise your hand using the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen and I'll call on you to ask your question. I'd now like to introduce our speakers, all of whom have a very special interest in Fragile X syndrome. Firstly, Dr. Helen Honey Hoysler is a developmental and pe behavioral pediatrician based at the Children's Hospital of Queensland. She has a special interest in developmental disorders, including Fragile X syndrome, and runs a sleep medicine clinic. She's well known to many Fragile X families. Michael Duig is an educational and developmental psychologist and clinical research manager at Children's Hospital of Queensland, working with Dr. Hoysler. Our third speaker, Professor Ted Brown, is a clinician and a researcher who has worked in the areas of autism and Fragile X syndrome for over 35 years. He's the recently retired director of the New York State Institute for Basic Research in Developmental Disabilities. He relocated to Australia several years ago and is based in Sydney. He's the president of Fragile X Association of Australia. Our next speaker will be Professor David Amor, who completed training as a paediatrician and is a clinical geneticist and clinician scientist with a research focus on human genetics. He works at the Royal Children's Hospital and Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne. Our final speaker who will join us for the Q&A panel is Dr. Natalie Silov. Dr. Silov is a behavioral and developmental paediatrician and head of child development services at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney. Dr. Silov has been seeing children with fragile X for many years. It's really wonderful to have them all join us for this event. I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Hoysler. Hi, thank you very much um, for asking me to talk tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the process of developing therapies for Fragile X syndrome. And this applies, I'm going to talk fairly generally, um, and about the process that drug development goes through before we even get it through to the clinic. So really trying to give you a framework to understand what we try to do in clinical trials. So it's important that you know that um, our, our centre does run a number of clinical trials sponsored by various um, drug companies, um, including Zynova Pharmaceuticals. And it's important that you're aware of these things as potential conflicts of interest. So um, that's a slide just declaring those conflicts of interest for our centre here in Brisbane. So... It's really, it's an interesting space working in the development of therapies for many of these genetic syndromes because there's probably a number of streams and concepts it's really important to understand. There is this notion of cure. How do we completely correct the problem that we see um, versus symptom management, which is really aligned towards managing troublesome symptoms that we see? And then 
other sort of strategies aimed at better outcomes via other mechanisms. And that relies a really on a really deep understanding of the impact of the genetic um, change that we see on how the proteins and molecules work within the body of somebody who has fragile X syndrome. So it's a combination of trying to think about the strategy that a certain therapy might be employing in terms of curative versus symptom management, i.e. hyperactivity, how do we manage that, or in fact employing better outcomes by targeting various molecules that might interact with um, the fragile X protein, etc. So people will commonly describe these as sort of genetic therapies or targeted molecular therapies or symptom management. I'm going to talk a little bit through those in a bit. And some of that symptom management really is, you know, aimed at things that are not necessarily specific to Fragile X. So, for example, we have quite good evidence around some therapies for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or for challenging behaviour in autism. Um, and what we do when we use those medications to support children with Fragile X is actually treat the symptom not necessarily always in the context of fragile X. So there's, there's differences in how we approach those things. So I think they're really important concepts to think about because even though we might treat some of the autism behaviours that we might see in fragile X with autism sort of directed medications, they're not necessarily specific to fragile X and those sorts of understandings and trials indeed have rarely been done. So when we think about Fragile X, we know a lot about how the Fragile X protein interacts or doesn't interact with multiple molecules involved in neurons and synapses and various receptors. And I'm really not going to go into too much detail, partly because of my age and I can't necessarily read it that well from this distance and it's quite small, but we do know there's very complex interactions with multiple um, sort of receptors, multiple pathways, many of whom have um, similar symptoms, if you like, and many of whom have similar comorbidities in terms of anxiety, autism-like features, ADHD. Um, so there's lots of similarities across many of these disorders. And so if you target particular proteins to regulate, upregulate, downregulate, they may um, sort of also have an impact on the outcomes that you might see. So the, this is where... Um, drugs might be targeted towards specific molecular pathways that are related to that diagnosis of Fragile X syndrome. Medications that we know that we have evidence for, um, such as those with ASD and ADHD or sleep disorders, we may use when we're talking about Fragile X. But the evidence is actually there for the symptom presentation, not necessarily for that symptom in Fragile X. So um, I'm just trying to make that really quite clear. And then the, the other concept that we have when we're thinking about drug development for therapies per se is that concept of developing new drugs versus repurposing of medications that might be used in other conditions. So where you understand that a drug might be used in tuberous sclerosis or another genetic disorder or might be used for headache or, you know, um, other things. And physiologically, it makes sense that it interacts with the pathway. Sometimes repurposing of medications can be used as well. So people are looking very extensively at each of these strategies when we um, are thinking about ther new therapies for um, individuals with Fragile X syndrome. So 
The other really important concept, I feel like I'm just putting a number of things in there, but they're all quite important things to understand, is that within medicine, when we're um, looking at the evidence that something works, what we're really looking for is um, levels of evidence. So, you know, um, somebody telling you that their great auntie three times removed tried something once and it seemed to work for her, isn't that's what we would call a case study or anecdotal evidence. In terms of medical hierarchy of evidence, there's quite a standard way we look at that. So it might be background information and opinion-based. Um, and so that's where I might say, well, I've used so much of this drug and it seems to work really well for my patients, whereas I haven't really necessarily always got a lot of evidence for that unless I've actually done formal studies around that. The next level of evidence is where you have a number of patients that uh, you've um, looked at in some detail and documented how things have gone and that is really where you might um, follow those patients for a while and you report that evidence. Then you might have studies where you follow people for a while and then randomised control trials are probably the next layer of evidence. And the thing is that mostly what we do when we're trialling new therapies is that um, the placebo effect is quite strong for all of us. And so we know that about 20% of people, regardless of what you give them, will respond positively to a placebo. The mind is a mighty powerful instrument. And so what we need to do is to make sure that any therapies that we try or try and improve outcomes with actually have a one, a good risk-benefit ratio, so the side effects are not significant and the benefit is more than that. And the other thing that we try and do is make sure that the effect of the therapy that we're trying is better than placebo, so better than nothing. Um, and it's really important that we do that. And then various levels above that really look at amalgamations and larger numbers and trying to pull together multiple studies to gradually build a case for something truly being effective in a particular um, symptom or disorder. So when people are developing drugs, it takes a long time. And part of it is when you're thinking about those very early steps around drug discovery, and that might be related to targeting particular molecules. It might be repurposing of drugs, um, might be your first element. And it's really important that those things are all tried in what we call in vitro, so in little chest tubes, so to speak, or in um, sort of in the laboratory to see that they're having the effect that one thinks they should on the various molecules involved. And so there's quite a process around that initial stage of drug discovery and making sure the molecules are doing what they're supposed to do. The next step is what we call a preclinical phase. And this is where animal studies might come into play. And um, there are lots of these sorts of animal studies that um, people will use, and they may use a variety of different sorts of animal models. And we know there are animal models of fragile X syndrome, and we know there are animal models of autism and a number of developmental disorders. And so testing these molecules or medications, whatever they might be, in animal models prior to moving to human models has been the conventional way of proceeding with drug trials. The other um, aspect that is starting to come into play a little bit more, more recently is understanding the effect of particularly drugs designed to have an impact in the brain, is looking at um, some of the um, neuronal um, development of stem cells. So where they take cells from um, a person, 
with a particular disorder and then they turn those cells into neurons. Now, in terms of basic effect on neurons and basic sort of impact on cells, that can sometimes be a useful strategy as well. So there's quite a lot of work goes on in the preclinical phase as well. And then we have to, tr so one of the challenges when we have animal models is that when we have particularly my, mouse models is that mouse models that we use in clinical trials are often all genetically very much the same or homogenous is what we call. So they are genetically very, very similar, whereas humans are not. We're a very mixed bunch. Um, and the geneticist on the team, Dr. Amor, will no doubt be able to support this is that most of us have a huge variety of variation in our genome. And so one of the challenges in clinical trials is taking a medication that seemingly looks like it might work in animal models in a very homogenous population. So mice with fragile X, uh, you know, you can run a trial in them and it'll all look really good. But then you test it in a very variable human population who might all have fragile X, but they'll have a lot of other variation in their genes and it might not work as well. So it's really important to go through each of these phases. The clinical trials I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but we have what we call phase one, phase two and phase three trials and phase four even in that space. And then there's ongoing review and monitoring of medications in the longer term. So one of the challenges, particularly in paediatrics, is that we're working with the developing brain all the time. And so it's a little bit different to the adult brain in that the impact we may have on the brain at the moment, while it might be a really good thing for the long term, sometimes the effect or potential difficult effects we may not see for a very long time. So ongoing monitoring of the effect of um, medications or trials on children's development in the longer term can be really important as well. So when we come back to those clinical trials, I've gone it, it talked about a little bit on this slide as well. So the drug research, preclinical. In the clinical trials, we have phase one, phase two, and phase three classically. Phase one is generally where we will take a small number of patients. And what we're doing is essentially testing if the treatment is safe and have we got the right dose to try with the patients. And it might be 20 patients, it might be 100 patients, but often it's smaller numbers than we'll use in later trials. And what we want to see is, is it safe? We would certainly, um, most ethics committees would not let new and novel medications be trialled in children without having some safety data in adults. Generally, the Ethics Committee would want to see safety data from adults before they would see, before they'd let you try it in adolescence, and then safety data in adolescence before they'll let you try it in younger children. So there are teams and committees out there that we have to put our proposals for these trials through so that they can make sure that things are as safe as they can possibly be when we're first starting these phase one trials. What we'll be doing is looking primarily for safety, but also to see if there's any clues as to where and what might be the most significant effects that we might be seeing. So what we call an efficacy component. So is something safe? And if it works, where does it work most? And I think that it can sometimes be a, a significant question because then you are trying to understand um, what sort of effect you're more likely to see in the following um, trials. And so 
then you would move on if you if something was reasonably safe and you might have seen an improved outcome in cognition or anxiety then that would be your primary target for your phase 2 um, and phase three trials possibly. So phase two trials are where you actually get much larger numbers of patients. And what you're doing is trying to determine whether that treatment actually works. You still collect safety data because the more safety data you have is the better. But what you're trying to do is see, A, whether the treatment works, B, do you have the right dose? And so sometimes there'll be various doses people might have in phase two trials. And C, does it work against placebo? So is it better than the sugar tablets or the um, inert um, sort of placebo that you might be using? So that's where you might have slightly larger trials of 100 to a couple of hundred people. Um, they're often randomised. So randomised means that um, you would uh, get an equal chance of getting either the drug or the placebo, and it's done through various computer things, but randomly assigned to receive one or the other. And it also means when we're talking about randomised control trials, they're randomised, they're matched often with um, people who are on placebo, but then there's various layers of what we call blinding. So it might be that you're running a randomised control trial that is blinded, and when it's blinded, it means that the people doing the assessments of whether the try or whether the medication or therapy is working actually don't know what medication or therapy you're on whether it's the actual drug or whether it's placebo so it gives it the the parents won't know either or the child and so it gives you the best opportunity of not being biased towards the results that you report and so a randomized blind con placebo control trial is where we're really looking to see whether a medication or a drug might actually be better than placebo and looking at the effect it has. When we do that, we also have to nominate what we're going to look at um, most tightly sort of in terms of our targeted therapy. So it might be that we might select um, anxiety as measured by a particular questionnaire as our primary outcome. And the analysis that we do has to focus on that. So scoping around and finding other random things that you might find in your analysis doesn't always um, give you valid results if you haven't designed your study necessarily to measure that. And they're often what we call secondary outcomes. So the primary outcome is what uh, um, we aim for most statistically, and the secondary outcomes are things of interest and definitely may um, alter what we do next. Phase three trials are often very large trials and they're really difficult to try and get through in um, rare disorders, largely because we just don't have the people around to do it. But they're often slightly larger scale than phase two and they're often a lot more definitive in actually what their primary and secondary outcomes will be. And so they still continue to measure safety and they still will be primarily looking for the efficacy in those primary and secondary outcomes. So the, then we move on through evaluation and phase four trials, which is that long-term safety and potentially cost effectiveness. Um, so if you're only seeing a mild effect um, and the medication costs more than your mortgage, then, you know, the cost effectiveness is probably poor. So it's important that we, as a public health system, um, really think very clearly about the cost effectiveness of medications um, in the longer term. 
the um, and the optimal use. So who is going to most benefit from this um, in the longer term? And then there may be broader things where you look at sort of larger scale impact um, over time. So just to summarise, and I think Ted is going to talk a little bit more about that, but there is an approval process that we have to go through as we go through clinical trials. Drugs need to be approved to be able to be tested in humans. So before we get to phase one trials, they need to be approved. Before we get to um, after phase three trials, there will need to be approvals in place before it goes for broader scale um, marketing. And Ted will talk a little bit more about those things as we go. The FDA in the States, which I don't understand as well as Ted will, will be able to elaborate a lot more on that. So all clinical trials um, are generally registered um, and there are a number of websites which you can sort of source out through the Australian Clinical Trials Register. There are various international clinical trials registers where you can actually search and see what trials might be being undertaken in autism or fragile X or any of those sorts of things. So in particular, there's an Australian Clinical Trials Registry Network, I think ACTRN, um, and they list the clinical trials that are going on um, at any one time. So that can be a nice place to actually look and see what's going on. One of the things, you know, coming back to that, and I just wanted to mention this because it's a little bit hard sometimes to understand why you might be interested in taking part in a clinical trial. So when we do the phase one study and we're trying to find where a trial or a therapy might be most efficacious, what we would then do is target our phase two and three trials to actually select the patient population and it depends on the study and what you're trying to treat. So there's no point in running a clinical trial of people with X syndrome and looking for a therapy that might target anxiety in that population. If you start to enrol people in the phase two and three studies that don't actually have anxiety, you're not going to get a valid result. So, for example, with fragile X and irritability or, or anxiety, what you need to do is make um, the screening process, which Michael will talk a little bit more about it, important that we actually see within the trial those patients, A, in the population, but B, who also have the particular traits that we're trying to target with the clinical trial. It's really important that we do that really well at screening and pre-screening to make sure that what we're aiming to treat is actually present in the population. And that next comment is really, I've already mentioned about age. So in terms of the safety data, we tend to go from oldest through to youngest, even when we think that the therapy may be most efficacious in little kids, we do need to see some of the safety in older patients. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Michael. Michael is our clinical research manager in our clinical trials unit for rare neurodevelopmental disorders in Brisbane and um, keeps us all well in line and running the trials very efficiently. So thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you, honey. Thank you for a great introduction. Um, and obviously, I'm just super chuffed to be sharing the virtual stage with all these obviously amazing and very knowledgeable people. Um, so, honey's just run through a whole bunch of, I guess, the theory behind clinical trials, whereas, you know, in my role um, with the centre as a psychologist and also the research manager, I'll be taking you through more of, I guess, the day-to-day -day or the practical side of things. Um, and I guess as opposed to, to common belief or stereotypes, we all don't wear white lab coats or have a clipboard that we roll around in. Um, you've got a picture of the team there. Um, so if you ever visit us at the Children's Hospital, that's what we look like. <clears throat> um, so I guess the clinical trials process. Um, 
Prior to, I guess, the pre-screening phase that we're going to get into, again, Honey touched on this briefly, um, we'll be contacted by, you know, a, a sponsor or a pharma company such as, you know, Zenerva in this instance, um, and they'll let us know that they're planning on doing a, a clinical trial, you know, something you know, in a disorder like Fragile X. Um, and we'll go through all, I guess, dotting the I's and crossing the T's with our um, ethical approvals and governance approvals. But once we get all our approvals in place, then um, we obviously start you know, trying to recruit people into these studies. So a part of the pre-screening phase is, you know, we let our um, family advocacy advocacy groups know. We advertise that the trial is open for recruitment via our web page. Um, and all these details are sort of contained uh, most likely on that web page, but also in that ANZ CTR um, website that Honey referred to earlier. Um, so once the trial is open and, and ready for recruitment, um, we'll, I guess, receive contacts and email addresses from the various families that want to get involved. And, and when they do reach out to our site, we'll just do, I guess, a basic eligibility criteria uh, check at that point in time, you know, is uh, your child uh, have the correct diagnosis? Um, are they of the same, the, the correct age? And, you know, in, in some trials that they're looking at boys only or girls only. So uh, agenda, sometimes we have to, to, you know, gather that information. After families pass, I guess, this pre-screening check, um, we send them out a, a PICF for a participant information and consent form. Um, and fam this is, a, I guess, a, a bit of a large document. It's on average, you know, 12 to 15 pages. And it really details um, what the trial is about and, and the steps and also the tasks that you as a parent, but also your child will have to sort of complete during that process. Um, so we send that out to families with lots of notice and then we'll book them in a time to come and see us uh, in the clinic. But, you know, during, a, during this whole process, they've got our contact details for any questions that may arise in the meantime. Um, so if everything goes to plan and they book in and see us and they come and visit us on site, well, the first thing we'll do is sort of review that consent process um, and sit down with sort of mums and dads and, and answer any questions that they may have uh, about the clinical trial. Um, this is, you know, done by our medical staff. So in most cases, it's honey. Um, and obviously, she's very knowledgeable. So she's able to sort of, you know, answer questions or queries that mums and dads have about the process or you know, the medication that's involved or any of the assessments that we're going to do throughout this time. Once those, I guess, those concerns are um, answered satisfactorily and mums and dads are happy to proceed, we get them to complete the consent process and, you know, autograph their name uh, on the PICF. And then that's when we sort of have the green light to um, start collecting the data that we need for this, for the trial. Um, and the main sort of first port of call we go through is the re to review the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this is just making sure that, you know, essentially uh, your young person um, is a good fit for the trial and the trial is a good fit for your young person. Um, so that, that sort of is a two-way street there. Um, within that sort of inclusion, uh, the review process, we look at, um, I guess, medical aspects. So we do exams um, there via Honey and the rest of the medical team. Um, myself and, and our other psychologists will look at um, some of the psychological assessments we do. So if we're targeting things like irritability, does your young person have, you know, a moderate to high level of irritability? If we're targeting, targeting anxiety, does your young person have a moderate or, or high level of anxiety? Um, there could be other things that we target in terms of thinking and reasoning skills and cognition, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of typically covered by the psychology staff. Um, and then finally, we'll unfortunately um, have to get a blood test from your little person. And this is to cover a number of things, but just making sure that, you know, their blood work is all in order or if there are other medications that he or she may be on that may interact with the trial medication, then that's sort of all catered for from the get-go. Um, after we complete all these procedures, obviously, um, we are not at that point yet. We're pretty good at it, but um, we can't get those pathology results instantaneously. So they normally take uh, two to three days to come back to us, and then we sit there and review them. And then if that's all good, we progress to the baseline period. Uh, so after that screening process is completed and, like I said, everything's all good, we get you back into the site and we, I guess, kick everything off with a baseline visit. Um, so again, we go through just a review of the inclusion exclusion criteria to make sure that your young person is still a good fit for the trial and the trial is still a good fit for your young person. Um, we sort of just give mums and dads a, a bit of an idea of the potential adverse sort of events or side effects that may happen. Again, at the front end of this, we've sort of 
had approval from the ethics committee. So we kind of have a good idea of what some of those potential side effects may be. Um, but like Honey said, everyone's different. So it may you know impact people differently. So we just try and stay on top of those. And then we go through, I guess, those baseline assessments, uh, again, with the, the medical assessments, the psychology assessments, looking at some of those behavioural symptoms. Um, and for some uh, of our clinical trials, we look at other assessments as well, whether it's sort of eye tracking or a gait analysis assessment. So um, it's a real horses for courses aspect to, to each individual clinical trial. At the baseline visit, you will also sort of get your first lot of medication um, and being, a, I guess, a, an experimental medication, we like to sort of run through how we, you would administer that or take that medication with mums and dads just to make sure that that process is sort of adhered to and, and smooth sailing. Um, and then uh, not always, but sometimes if we've had a bit of a gap between our screening appointment and our baseline appointment, we may have to repeat some of the blood work. Um, you know, in some instances, the, the time difference between a screening and a baseline is sort of a week to two weeks. But for various reasons, you know, some families, you know, might have to unexpectedly, probably not in COVID times, take off and go for a holiday or school holidays sort of happen. And, you know, if there's a bit of a gap in between that time period, we like to repeat those, I guess, blood samples just to make sure everything's still above board. Um, depending on the length of the clinical trial, um, we'll sort of go through this process three to four times. So if it's a, you know, a 12 week, uh, clinical trial, we'll look at a baseline visit, a week four visit, a week eight visit, and then, uh, a week 12 visit, which in some cases is the end of study visit. So this visit is very similar to our first study visit. So again, you'll come into the site and you'll complete a thorough assessment of, um, the different. I guess, procedures that we've been through. Um, by this point in time, mums and dads are pretty much pros at all the assessments that we have to do. So they sort of, you know, know the, know the deal when they come in and see us. So again, they'll complete um, the medical assessments, the psychology assessments, and also just finishing off with the pathology assessments again with the blood draws. Um, so at this time, it's sort of, you know, depending on what we call the design of the trial, this could be it. And we say, thanks for coming. And, you know, we, we part ways there. And then um, I guess other clinical trials have what we call an open label extension. So after that sort of randomised control trial phase for that initial, you know, sometimes it's 12 weeks, sometimes it's 24 weeks. Um, when that ceases, then there is an option there, depending on, you know, the, the plan with the clinical trial for young people to jump onto that open label extension. Um, and this is just a way to sort of access the medication ongoing um, you will have to come in and visit the site at various stages, but it's not as frequent um, as you would have visited during the RCT phase. And then next. So this is, um, I guess, my final slide for my presentation here. And it's just sort of outlining that because, you know, it's a clinical trial, it's an experimental medication, um, we just don't know the impacts that this may have. So, you know, this may really support and help your young person with some of their symptomology. It may have no impact at all. Um, it may unfortunately have a bit of an, an adverse effect or a side effect and, and, a, and a negative impact. Um, but because of that nature of, of clinical trials, you know, we try and really provide a five-star service. So you get an information card in case of emergency so that if your little person has an accident, they have to go to emergency, then they have a number that they can ring where, you know, one of us from the team can answer that phone call and make sure that we can guide the emergency physician through any of the, the needs to know basis things in terms of the the experimental medication. Uh, as a centre, we're always contactable for any questions or concerns. You definitely don't have to wait till your next visit or anything like that to get in touch with us. Um, I guess during these times with COVID and travel restrictions, um, you know, we've been able to modify our approach quite well and um, implement the use of telehealth and I guess various cur uh, courier services for medication deliveries, etc. Um, and I guess the, the beauty of, and I, I mean this in the nicest way to the other PIs on the call here, I think we have the best team. Um, and that's particularly because we have, I guess, uh, a dedicated research team with, with a really cool skill set in terms of psychology, nursing, uh, medical and, and trial coordination and, and support staff. So if there's a question or concern that you may have about a trial or you know, um, ideas for upcoming clinical trials, et cetera, are always open to sort of those lines of communication. Lovely.
So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ted Brown, who's obviously the president and familiar face for all those on the um, audience. And he's, the, like I said, the president of the Fragile X Association of Australia. Over to you, Ted. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, I'd like to um, cover a bit of what's going on when the drug actually is finished with the testing and how then does it get approved so that you, the families can have access to it. Um, and, and it's kind of new to me here, uh, kind of an immigrant here to Australia. I'm more familiar with the FDA. <clears throat> We've heard of the stories of uh, the problems they've had recently approving um, the, a new drug for Alzheimer's disease and the issues that that raised. But uh, anyway, here in Australia, it's, um, it's a little different than that. So I'd like to go through the, these. The next slide, please. So as Michael covered, um, you and the families come in and are invited to come in and participate in the trial. Um, and, and certainly you have to consider a variety of, of factors as to whether this is right for you. I mean, it involves perhaps potentially a risk um, since there are new drugs sometimes that are being tested. It's certainly a time commitment and there could be costs involved in getting to there and paying for parking or whatever. Uh, there sometimes are reimbursements for the travel uh, that are set up with these trials. There could be potential side effects that, and that's hopefully they're safe to begin with the testing phase one, but it's always possible. And uh, we know that, for example, the approval of the vaccines for COVID, you know, there are these rare but important side effects that have, that have come about that, we should we should know about and know the risks, and and the treatment could turn out not to actually be effective. Um, but um, the uh, you know the benefit of participating in a trial is that it's uh, really to for the future of the condition that you're trying to uh, help, not only with your child potentially benefit, but the the, the community of people that have children with fragile X syndrome are potentially going to benefit from the knowledge that will come from your participating. So it's, it's a kind of a generosity on your part to help out with this goal of coming up with what could be good, better treatments. Next, please. So after the trial is finished, um, the data then gets analyzed by the team, by the uh, the scientific group that's uh, set up to look at the results. And this can sometimes take some time. It could take a, a few months. Um, it could take several years in some cases. Um, and we know that uh, being involved in a trial, you'd like to know about the outcome. Were you on the placebo or were you on the, uh, the drug? And that may not be available, that information, even to the investigators for some time until after they've studied it. And usually the results from a trial get published in a journal, a scientific manuscript gets submitted and gets accepted for publication. And then once that, that, that happens, then the actual results of the trial can be uh, known and disseminated to other scientists and other investigators throughout the world. And usually the results are placed on the website of the drug company, the pharmaceutical company that sponsored the, the study. And at that time too, the patient organizations that are set up for clinical trials should be informed and, and learn about the outcome of the trials. Next slide. And now once the drug has been at, at that point, finished the trial, getting it approved for actual use, it, for, particularly for rare disease, is, it's not so easy. And this uh, graph that we have here um, shows that actually rare disease therapies are more likely to gain approval than our drugs are, that have been developed or being developed for more chronic diseases. And it shows that um, the going from a phase one to a phase two trial, a lot of the studies will drop out because they're not found to be uh, safe or effective at all. <clears throat> 
Um, and then going from a phase two to a phase three trial, there's also a, a more marked dropout. And so only a few drugs will get to that point where they're eligible and, and the funding is a present to, to push you on for a phase three trial, such as Sonny described. And then beyond that, then they have to go through the actual uh, regulatory approval from the uh, government uh, committees, which I'll cover a little bit next. Next trial, next slide, please. And this is a rather complicated uh, graph of or illustration of how this actually occurs here in Australia. Um, it's uh, it's complex and lengthy, and I'm not going to try to uh, not go through each of these on this graph but on this uh, slide, but I'll try to go through some of the ins and outs of this process. Next slide. So the regulatory approval process here in Australia, the first step is to get um, approval by the committee that's set up called the Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA, in Australia. And this is a committee made up of doctors, of, of patient representatives, of, of various specialists in the field, and they're responsibility is, is to ensure that the drug that's being submitted for approval is safe and fit and it doesn't fit the intended purpose. And they go through a process of pre-market evaluation uh, to look at the safety and efficacy within a certain period of time. So once the drug company submits this uh, study to the TGA, in principle, they, they're supposed to get finished within uh, a year, within two, 255 working days which turns out to be 10.5 months. And they determine whether to approve it, whether to allow it to then be submitted further for further uh, approval. And the standard time for this is on the order of a year or, or a little longer. Next slide. So this figure shows that, um, you know, the winnowing down of these drugs, the drug discovery phase, there could be thousands of compounds that are tested. Some are selected, say 250 for a given condition. And they then find that after the preclinical or mouse studies or animal studies that really only five are promising. And then these go through the phases and you might be left then with one new drug to test in a, in a drug study. Next. Now, once the TGA has approved this, saying it looks to be beneficial and safe and effective, then the next step is to go through the approval to get it uh, made available for uh, use in, in the population, in the, the patients can then have access to it. And the PBS is a Australian government program and it subsidizes such recommended drugs to make them more affordable to patients. And the uh, independent government committee, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee is set up to consider these approved TGA um, uh, drugs and to consider whether they should actually be uh, allowed to be uh, given approval. And it's a formal process. Um, it involves consumers and consumer groups to actively engage with these processes. Next. So the submission from the, after the TGA approves it, then the submission is then lodged with the PBAC. And this is generally done by the drug company, the pharmaceutical company as soon as possible after the TGA approval. And this committee meets three times a year and it, to discuss this review and submission. And they have this an, a, a agenda that they announce uh, well in advance. And in fact, uh, then they encourage consumers, families, patients, and clinicians to give their opinion about this drug. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be beneficial? And they have about a six-week time period to provide these comments. And families here play a big role in providing comments. How good do they find that, you know, this the problem in their child? And how do they think this drug would be helping? And this is where our organization, the Fragile X Association of Australia can and, and will encourage the community of families with Fragile X to become involved. 
Next. <clears throat> Sometimes the, uh, this committee, the PBAC, needs to consider a number of times. And you need to meet several times to provide the right decision about the drug. And the whole process for this can take at least two years from the time of the submission of the TGA before the final approval. After the uh, PBAC recommends it, approves it to the government, then the government will list this on the PBS, the Medicare subsidized system that you have here. And they go through though a consideration of the, um, the government and the med and this drug company or the medic medicine sponsor. They have to agree on a, an acceptable price for the medicine to be listed. And the health department also can find if they can find equivalent drugs that are, are, are less, or they, the health department has to find some way to offset the cost of this. So this is a policy that's a, a government process and is under review. But it turns out the average time for the PBAC uh, to make the positive recommendation is on the order of three to four months. At least that was in 2019. And this uh, final slide that I have here is just shows this complex process, which typically, typically can take two years once the drug has finished the clinical testing before it can get finally approved and, and submitted for the, to the PBS for the uh, subsidized uh, coverage of the drug's cost. So I think that's all I'm going to cover. Uh, I think we're going to go back to Honey now to have uh, a discussion of, of the recent Sinerva trial that, that she's been involved with. Honey? So um, we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the trials that are available. And I'll start by um, talking through the um, trials that we've had with um, Zynerba um, just to kick this off and then hand over to David and Ted. So Zynerba Pharmaceuticals um, came to us several years ago now and um, initiated a phase one study. So it's a really nice example of working through that phase one, two, three um, trials to actually take a product to um, having enough evidence to then go for formal approval. So the phase one study was completed with Natalie Silov, who's online tonight, and Jonathan Cohen's team in Melbourne. And it was initially what we call an open label trial where patients knew what they were taking. It was about 20 patients. And the safety profile was deemed really quite safe. And we found quite positive results. And you can see some of those there at the top with significant improvements in um, social, social avoidance. Hang on, I just need to get it a bit bigger. Um, and uh, hyperactive behaviour, um, social avoidance, generalised anxiety seem to be the things that we um, saw most affected. So that was where we were trying to find the targets of what might be um, reasonable things to start to think about in a randomised controlled trial. And so after that, um, we moved to what we called a phase two, three trial. So it was a little bit of a mix of both but designed to be a study that would meet phase three requirements as well. So that was really designed with the primary outcome of um, looking at the ABC community um, social avoidance subscale. So that was markedly because we had the social avoidance as a, a sort of really significant outcome in the open label trial. But with the phase two, three study, what it was was about 110 um, kids in the received the um, medication and about the same number received placebo. And the primary outcome, remember I said before that you have to design what you're targeting right from the very beginning. And we didn't see what we call a significant change in the people who received the drug, 
versus those who received the placebo. So we did see some positive changes, but what we didn't see was a significant difference between those that received placebo and those that received um, the drug. And so that was the primary outcome. However, when they went back and reanalyzed some of the data, um, and this, this information's been published, you can see, or has been presented at least um, in the past, you can see um, the study design you were seen initially screened and then randomised to either having the treatment or the placebo and then proceeded on to an open label trial. So you then went and that open label trial is ongoing and collecting longer term safety and efficacy data. That sub-analysis that we did in that study suggested that in particular subgroups of people with Fragile X, there was actually a significant response in a, a significant signal, if you like, in that social avoidance, irritability, disruptive behaviours. So slightly more people reported that positive response in the people who got the treatment than the placebo, but it wasn't um, significant in our primary outcome. So in that particular subgroup, um, it really suggested that there may be a group within Fragile X that it would people would respond to, and that that was really those that were um, fully methylated or slightly more severe in their symptoms. And this is where trials can sometimes go a bit um, have less of an effect is because of that variability in humans. So the ongoing the open label extension is ongoing in that group and so the when they went to the regulatory authorities and please correct me if i'm wrong those people who are online about this the regulatory authority said well your statistical analysis isn't exactly aligned to isn't you know, significant for your primary outcome. So we do need to see more information on the group that you think this is significant for. And so the tie-up has been in that regulatory um, element of it and getting more data and more information. So the Reconnect Fragile X study is about to kick off and that's a phase three and so randomised, as I've described before, double blind, so Patients are blinded, the clinicians are blinded, um, placebo controlled, so you have either placebo or drug, multi-centre efficacy and safety study. So we continue to collect safety data all the time. And that's where the blood tests in particular are really important to look at the effect on liver function and other things. And that study um, has been designed to evaluate the efficacy in patients aged 3 to 18 and the treatment of the behavioural symptoms. The so this is a symptom-based treatment to fit it into where we were talking about before. And really what they will be doing is collecting information, particularly around the methylation status, to try and see which groups that this will have most effect for. Um, so that study is about to um, get started and there are a number of sites in Australia taking part in that. So, David, do you want to talk about other things that are sort of percolating in this world? Thank you very much, honey. I realised I was muted, but um, I've been kindly unmuted by uh, the tech support. So uh, thank you. And um, thanks to honey and Michael and Ted for really an amazing uh, summary of sort of A to Z of clinical trials. And I haven't really got... Well, other than to agree with um, everything that you said, I haven't got anything specific to add um, to that. But I guess um, I'm obviously in Melbourne and, and we run clinical trials for neurodevelopmental disorders, somewhat similar to, to Honey and Michael. We have our own Michael, but her name is Kylie. Mm -hmm. um, um, and she's also very good. And um, we are currently looking or hoping to run a trial probably starting early next year for a drug, a drug called Xanimum. And um, 
This is a drug that alters the way um, steroids uh, um, function within neurons in the brain and it's a drug that um, has or is under trial at the moment for outside Alzheimer's disease, so in, in elderly people. Um, and this we hope will be a phase two trial of uh, male adolescents, um, so not, not young children at this stage. Um, but we're still going through the um, some of the early hoops that um, that uh, Honey and Michael have described in terms of uh, getting the protocol better down and, and um, ethics approval and so forth, which is a bit of a journey, but hopefully one that we will uh, go through in the next few months. That's all for me for now. <clears throat> Okay, I'm, I'm just going to give you a brief summary of uh, one other drug company that uh, is based in Australia or New, Ze or New Zealand that's called Neuron, and they had a drug that uh, had, a had been tested in a phase two trial in Fragile X in the States and was recently published. It took about three or four years for the publication to come out, and it seemed to have some beneficial effects. So. They haven't yet planned for a phase three trial, but that's possible in the op often. The drug is um, actually being tested in another syndrome, Rett syndrome. So there's, there's a consideration that that might come back and get into trials here. Uh, and it looked very promising in the animal studies and the clinical studies. So I think I'll turn it back over now to Wendy for the question and answer series. Is that where we should go, Wendy? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Honey and Michael and Ted and uh, David, uh, for giving us uh, a terrific uh, sense of the journey uh, from uh, from discovery through to further research through to the practicalities of participating in a trial and um, also a sense of what's on the near horizon um, with some trials uh, set to begin uh, quite soon. So what we'd like to do now is um, really open up for some questions. Um, again, if anyone has any questions for the panel, the panel is... Um, uh, Dr. Honey Hoistler, it's Michael Duig, it's um, Dr. David Amor, it's Professor Ted Brown, and Dr. Natalie Siloff from Westmead Children's Hospital, who's joining us uh, for the panel as well. So we have a couple of questions that have come up in the chat panel. So I think I'd like to start with those. And if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask verbally, very, very welcome. Just uh, Raise your hand using the raise hand function um, and we'll ask you to uh, share your question. So here we have uh, a question here. Uh, there was an article on the Fraxa website, the Fraxa website from the US that mentioned the potential of an Alzheimer's drug by Tetra Pharma that showed potential in males with Fragile X syndrome. Is this the same one that Dr. Amor mentioned? An Alzheimer's uh, drug uh, which Tetra has been looking at. Talk about it, David, or? No, no, I'm happy for you. I was just going to say no, but you, you may have more detail. Yeah. Um, that's a drug that was tested in a small group of people. It was a drug that increased cyclic AMP. So it didn't have anything to do with the steroid system that David talked about with actinogen. And the company is uh, was bought out uh, by a Japanese pharmaceutical company and there's possibly plans to in increase the trials for this drug, but it hasn't yet been formalized or announced, but it's quite a different drug and has a very interesting, the results from that drug look to be very promising in, in that it showed an improvement in cognition uh, for the first time in such a drug study. But there was a different drug than the one that potentially will be starting up here in uh, Australia in the, in the next uh, few months. There's another question that's popped up in the chat panel. Is the Reconnect FX Phase 3 just available for Queensland residents and indeed uh, 
uh, in, in other parts of the country, how would people in other um, locations participate? Uh, and I guess the question is, is it available for participation in sites other than Queensland? Honey, can I pass that question to you? You can. Um, my understanding is that they are looking at multiple sites. I think, Natalie, are you involved in Phase 3 for Reconnect? Yes, uh, we are running a trial centre at, at Children's Hospital Westmead. Um, and I think that the uh, there should be a... Um, an area that will be on the Fragile X website um, because patients will be able to come in from quite far out of town as well. So I think, so, uh, and I think in Victoria, I think Jonathan's clinic, is that involved? Yes, I understand that that's yeah. um, uh, underway. The, um, the various processes are, are underway there at, um, at Jonathan's clinic as well. And they're, they're usually when um, people are interested in trials, it's always worth talking to one of the sites because we all generally know who's um, involved and either then um, looking to seek for travel reimbursement to be able to get to sites is certainly feasible. Um, you know, in some of the last studies, what we've done is actually taken people from other states as well, um, where that's been feasible for family and um, there's been ability to fund that travel. It's not always available, but certainly at times that is certainly feasible to travel for the visits that you need to get there for. So um, we're aiming to try and certainly have sites in Brisbane, Sydney and Victoria um, at this point. There's another question that's here in the in the chat that is um, a question that I've certainly been asked a number of times to what are the main obstacles for us to proceed with more trials in Australia? It does seem, doesn't it often, that there's a lot going on in the US, for example, but it's been, uh, there haven't been many trials in the recent past. What are the main obstacles uh, to having more opportunities to participate, having more pharmaceutical companies interested in running trials here. David, why don't you take that? Sorry, Ted, you pass that to to David. I thought oh, David sorry. would be a <laughs> my good name. One yeah, to thank answer. You. Thank you, Ted. Um, Look, uh, I think, um, in fact, at the moment, Australia seems to be quite a popular place to do clinical trials and barely a week seems to go by that um, we don't get approached by one company or another, not, not just talking about Fragile X, but talking about drugs for neurodevelopmental disorders or th therapeutics um, in general. Um, and I, I think there's recognition that, yeah, Australia is a good place to do this. In the case of Fragile X, Partly we're limited by the number of patients and this is going to be a, an issue um, for a lot of rare diseases um, in the coming years is that we're actually going to have more potential therapies to trial than we have uh, patients in whom to trial them in. And, and um, whilst for a lot of these trials, a, a patient or a child could potentially go from one, one trial to another, you know, every sort of six months or 12 months or so, um, that is probably beyond the... Um, the stamina of um, of a lot of the families. So um, we certainly have the capacity to run the trials. The the, the challenge is getting enough patients uh, through the door um, to make you know to to justify the um, the effort. Um, not only on the on the part of us, but of the the companies that are sponsoring the trials as well. Yes, and that critical mass, David, too. The the trials will have a certain minimum number of participants, won't they? Yeah, and so, I mean, often the, the numbers that are expected of Australian centres often aren't huge. It might be, for example, just five uh, patients for a centre um, would be sufficient for a trial to be set up. But um, recruitment is, I mean, for, for a lot of research, um, including trials, it can be surprisingly uh, difficult in my experience. There's, there's a lot of barriers uh, both as part of the trial design and then obviously practical barriers for families for participation 
um, in trials because as as Michael discussed, you know, a lot of the, the trials are quite demanding on families in terms of lots of visits and tests and so forth. And, and sometimes with families where you've got both parents with um, a high level of work and caring responsibilities, that's, that's a big challenge. There's another question in the chat box, uh, which I think, honey, I might direct to you. Are there any medical trials upcoming that younger children can participate in? I guess that would be the Zynerba Sure. Everyone goes down to three years of age. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of other trials at the moment, I think it comes back to a lot of the things coming through really need to have that safety data in the older kids before they can move down to younger trials. Ted, do you know of anything coming up in younger kids? Well, um, there is a, a large trial <clears throat> to reassess the uh, Novartis drug in three to five-year-olds that Lisbury Kravitz is running with okay. a number of centers in the U.S. It's, I think they've finished enrollment, but they were hoping to get uh, 100 subjects in the study. And it's the, it should be, and each of the kids was to be on it for a full year. So it's, uh, it should be, it's still double-blinded, but it should be read out sometime this fall or okay. early next year. There's another question here um, in the chat box around, but around older uh, individuals who have fragile X syndrome. Is the Queensland trial limited to three to 18 year olds? My son is 33, almost 34, and he would be keen to join that trial. Honey, what's on the horizon? Um, uh, is there anything on the horizon for older individuals with fragile X syndrome coming through from the Zynerba work? or other work that you know of? Not that I'm aware of for us here in Queensland. We are limited by the fact that we're a children's hospital. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a developing partnership with the adult disability group at the next door hospital. Um, but um, from our perspective, we are mostly limited to the paediatric age group. There, um, I think they they have tried some of these, some of the, oh, I don't know. I can't remember. There was some safety data in adults um, initially that was um, done in the States, I think, um, but not a, not a huge trial as far as I'm aware. Uh, another question here uh, around research a little bit more broadly in the Fragile X space. Do you think, does the panel think the new pre-mutation registry will lead to more research for carrier-related symptoms and treatments. Ted, perhaps that's a question for you. Yeah, I, I think it certainly will lead to more interest and more research to have a registry of patients, uh, people that have a premutation, that then when investigators want to do a study, they can see if any, uh, they can recruit subjects for their studies. And that hasn't been available. It hasn't been possible up until now. So. It's, I'm sure it'll lead to more related research on carriers and, and treatments that might be available for them. There's another question uh, here in the chat. Following a clinical trial, successful or otherwise, for how long does the open label availability of the drug continue, generally speaking, given that it may be different for different studies? Um, yeah, it, it depends on, um, I guess, want the, what the pharmaceutical company or the sponsor um, wants to do in that regard. You know, sometimes it's 12 months, um, sometimes it's 24. We've seen up to, you know, 36 and 48 for the open label extensions. Um, so quite a long period of time. I think one um, bit of, I guess, um, a, a thought that you have to factor in is that if that particular pharma company is looking to, I guess, roll this out to the, the wider audience, you know, across Australia via, you know, the TGA or the PBS, um, once it gets sort of approved in that area, then I think the, the open label extension sort of um, may cease in that regard. There's another related question. Um, and a, a good one for you, Michael, too. Can the blood test for trials be done via local pathology centres or do participants always need to go to the research centre? 
Uh, that's a that's a really good question. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day, for us um, as a site, uh, mums and dads are the experts when it comes to their kid. So we prefer for mums and dads and, and the kids to come in and see us and use our pathology just because the team in pathology, this is all that they do day in and day out. So I guess they're quite versed with, I guess, kids or difficult kids or kids with developmental, uh, you know, disorders like um, our fragile X kids that might have a different sensory profile to a typical kid. Um, so I guess our preference is, but given, I guess, COVID restrictions, movement restrictions, et cetera, they definitely can be done by your local, you know, Pathology Queensland or QML or, you know, whoever's in sort of in your neighbourhood. And then we organise, I guess, the couriering and, you know, how it sort of all gets to where it needs to go um, after the blood sample's taken. Well, that leads nicely into a question that I was asked before the webinar. What sort of impact is uh, COVID having now and will it have into the future uh, in the way that clinical trials are run in comparison with the uh, sort of frequent visit and high touch uh, model that has been uh, the model for the past? Michael, how do you see it playing out with uh, restrictions on movement and um, and so on. Um, I think you know David mentioned this earlier with his um, his comment around Australia being a, a bit of a, a shining light actually when it comes to the, the clinical trial game because of the way that we've handled COVID. Handled COVID, you can see I guess in the states and in the UK, um, it's still pretty rife despite. I guess them going back to business as usual. So we've been actually able to pivot quite well in these times. Um, and we've actually just, you know, recently had a couple of, of chats to, to various other pharma companies and they've built in things like, um, you know, mid-study uh, phone calls and, and those sorts of things in replacing, you know, face-to-face -face visits at the site. So with the advent of telehealth and, and that sort of thing, we're able to send, you know, some of our psychological assessments uh, via email to mums and dads to fill out in the comfort of their own home. Um, and we might be able to plug into their local GPs to do some of the medical bits and then get them to, to visit the pathology that's normally attached to the GP to, to do the sample and the blood draws. So um, it's been quite, I guess, um, good being able to sort of pivot and, and just change the way that we do business a wee bit um, in, in the face of COVID. The one thing that we yeah, have struggled with a, a wee bit is just with the, the border closures and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the, the telehealth facilities played a really big role in, in still, I guess, making sure that we keep um, our, our participants up to date with the, the latest information and also making sure that they're you know, being uh, looked after during their clinical trial journey. Well, that sounds quite positive, Michael. It doesn't sound as if you know, the gate has been closed on all, all work um, in this area. So that's great. There's another question here that's come through the chat box. Uh, with reference to the pre-mutation uh, uh, registry that we had a question on earlier, are there plans to use the pre-mutation registry to recruit participants into Fragile X clinical trials through the families? Why don't, you answer, why don't you answer that, Wendy? You've attended many of the... Uh Premutation meetings. Well, I have indeed um, attended some of the premutation meetings, and in fact, there are no plans that we're aware of, um, and that I've heard from the committee to uh, to recruit participants for fragile X syndrome clinical trials through the families. The, the primary focus uh, right now is on collecting data about premutation conditions. Um, that's a question we could put to the registry committee in the US, um, certainly. Uh, another question uh, on a similar note around registries is, do the researchers um, and the people on the panel see a need or a benefit for an Australian Fragile X Syndrome registry or information database, quite distinct from premutation? Honey, can I throw that one to you? Is there a benefit in having a Fragile X Syndrome registry or information database? Listen, I'm a great believer in the benefit of information. 
because I think we all learn from families and the with registries and information databases and people understanding the natural sort of challenges that people have and the variation in a particular disorder. I think sort of registries and natural history studies are in really important and really valuable. The, the challenges sometimes with rare disorders um, in the Australian context is then being able to link that information to large data sets so that you actually get enough information to know where something is an outlier or something is a little bit different. So I absolutely think that registries, natural history studies, um, databases are really, really valuable in terms of learning um, and we learn from families all the time. So absolutely, really um, can see the value in that. Great. Thanks, honey. The next question is going back to um, trials for children. Are there any autism trials that may benefit children who have Fragile X syndrome and autism? Natalie, David, do you want to? Um, yeah, I, I guess um, there are certainly autism trials underway at the moment and, and, you know, in the future there will undoubtedly be overlap between some of the compounds that are tried in autism, or trialled in autism with those um, with Fragile X. In general, I would say most of the autism trials exclude uh, single gene syndromes that have um, aut um, autism symptoms. Um, so they would exclude someone with Fragile X from the autism trial. But um, so, yeah, I, I can't think of any trial off the top of my head, um, honey may know of some, but I'm not aware of any where it's an autism trial that, that would accept a, um, a Fragile X participant. There are trials at the moment through BMRI in Sydney using oxytocin um, in autism, and they are including children with Fragile X syndrome. And there's a randomised controlled trial with the uh, oxytocin, um, all the children getting the early Denver intervention um, program. Yeah, and we start Denver. Yeah, and then randomised to oxytocin and uh, and placebo nasal spray. Okay. So that, that trial is available through BMRI. And if someone wanted some more information about that, Natalie, could I pass it to you? Yeah, sure. Lovely, thank you. Uh, a question here, uh, is the ZYN002 gel trial the same as the CBD gel trial? Yes. So, yes, it is. So the ZYN002, ZYN uh, relating to Zynerva, that's yeah. right. Now, here's another question. This question is around approval processes. If a treatment, um, and it might be a question for you possibly, Ted, if a treatment is approved by the FDA in the US, does this bypass or shorten the approval process uh, with the TGA for availability in Australia? Uh, what, if any, would be the lag to receive FDA-approved therapies in Australia? Well, the, the experience is that for actually for many chronic diseases, you know, where you where the studies involve thousands of patients, that it often is and it, drugs that get approved here often have been received prior approval by the FDA and that shortens the process that it, it helps, you know, along, but it's it, it here in terms of rare diseases, actually um, there have been very few drugs approved for rare diseases. Maybe SMA is, is kind of the exception where it was approved for treat for in the U S and then, and then it's gotten approved here later. So there is some benefit to having it approved outside. And, and But it's uh, for rare diseases, we don't yet have that many approved treatments. So there is still those um, regulatory processes that you spoke about, Ted, um, right. in that program. It's still a journey then for uh, medications to go through the, the required processes in Australia, through the TGA and then on to... Um, right, right. 
That's right. It doesn't guarantee automatic approval. And, and no. I, Thank you. Uh, a question. I, can, here. Uh, Hannah, I was going to ask you the axial trial. Um, with regards yeah. to bowel GI symptoms, are uh, are they excluding fragile X or fragile X is an inclusion? I think I can't remember if genetic syndromes are an exclusion. I, th I think that I may be included, and there is a um, there is an NHMRC funded trial at the moment for three to eighteen for people with an intellectual disability, um, which is an oral um, can uh, cannabinoid um, formulation with uh, Daryl Efron, the CI, and we're running a, a center at Westmead as well. So people with fragile X syndrome it could be included in that too, but it's an oral formulation. The Axial One is a um, gut microbiome um, therapy that is looking at preventing the absorption of some of the sort of toxins you get from abnormal microbiome. Um, and that is due to kick off fairly soon. I don't recall genetic syndromes being an exclusion factor, um, but we can check that. Uh, here's a, a question. Um, my son was involved with trials at the Serpentine Clinic in the late 90s on ADD and autism. Has the panel had any contact or access to the studies they conducted? My son was put on a non-prescription therapy, which made a noticeable difference. So that's the Serpentine Clinic, an autocorrection there. Does anyone know of that clinic in the 90s looking at ADD and autism? Yeah, I knew Serpentine very well, and uh, it was a big clinic in the city. I'm not sure what particular substance. Unfortunately, uh, um, it doesn't exist in that form anymore, that clinic. Um, but I'm not. I'm unaware of what medication would have been used. I don't know what the... Mm, perhaps we can follow that up, Ted. We might follow that up. Um, yeah, I've never heard of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't. The actual clinic doesn't exist in that form anymore. He unfortunately passed away. So it's. Mm. But well, look, we're coming uh, close to nine thirty. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, the participants, uh, any questions they'd like to put into the chat box or ask the panel? I have one more, Michael. While um, people are thinking, if they've. Um, considering whether they've got another question. Go what, for it. What sort of practical advice would you give a family in preparing their little person um, with fragile X syndrome for coming along to a visit, whether it's at your clinic or a clinic in Sydney or a clinic in uh, Melbourne uh, for participation in a clinical trial? How yeah, that... this... Sorry. You go, Wendy. How best to prepare the little person? Because mm -hmm. hospitals are not always um, our favourite places. Yeah, correct. And that, that's the point that I was just going to make. Uh, for us up in Queensland, um, we've got the luxury of being just over the road from the actual children's hospital. So we've sort of made it so that mums and dads actually come straight in, park underneath our building and they get zipped up in the lift. And, you know, we've got our clinic room that we've put, you know, some nice posters up and they're greeted with sort of a, the same familiar face each time they come into the clinic with, with our nursing staff. So I guess for that first, um, initial appointment it's just letting you know having mums and dads sort of letting their little person know that um, yes they're going to hospital per se but it's not going to be one of those you know visits where doctors are going to poke and prod and that sort of thing it's actually if we're being honest uh, us psychologists probably put the mums and dads under more of a microscope than we do for the, the kids in this regard with uh, you know the CNS disorders because everything for us is behavioural like we, we don't have a blood test for irritability or you know, for anxiety per se, it, it's all, you know, questionnaire based. So um, I think just trying to comfort and allay those fears to, to the young person just through conversations um, and, and just sort of a taking a leaf out of, you know, if your young person's already doing some type of therapy, whether it's OT or 
cycle and whatnot, maybe, you know, pinching a social story and, and weaving that into, um, you know, on a Friday, we're going to go visit this guy named Michael and he's in this fancy looking building and, you know, Dr. Honey will be there as well with some of the other the, some of the other nursing staff and we're going to go have a chat to them and, you know, mum and dad's going to fill out a whole bunch of questionnaires and, you know, Dr. Honey will get me to jump up and down on, on one leg and, and hop along and that sort of thing, just sort of a real... I guess comfort and play based type of setup because for that for that screening visit we will do everything we can to try and you know a comfort the child we've got toys we've got the you know the screen parent aka the iPad there um, but we'll go through all sort of the inclusion exclusion stuff before we get to sort of the nitty gritty we've got to go walk over and see pathology and you know they've got to that's the the, that's the tricky part with with our group and you know in pediatrics in general is the is the blood test and the needle um so we try and make sure that when we get to that point everything is sort of you know all systems go for eligibility and, and being included in the trial before we sort of you know put our little person through that that trauma um so that's kind of yeah the advice that I would give to mums and dads if they're if they're going to come visit us. But like I said at the top of this, mums and dads are the experts. So we often will say, you know, bring in a toy, bring in a blanket, bring in a teddy bear. Um, if they're better in the morning, let's do a morning appointment. If they're better after lunch, let's do an after lunch appointment. We 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 try and be super flexible. Now here's a great uh, question to to finish off with. This is a question for everyone on the panel. What's the most rewarding part of being involved in research? What gets you out of bed in the morning? You go first, Michael. (laughs) Oh, goodness gracious. Um, A a lot of things. But for me, um, having that conversation with a mum or dad or mum and dad and them just being able to do, uh, I guess, one of the normal things things whether it's you know go out to dinner as a family to celebrate a birthday because their little person has you know got to that that stage where they're able to deal with you know social anxiety or they're able to deal with um the increased uh sensory input through noise and that sort of thing and and just kind of you know be a typical family and celebrate a birthday at a restaurant on a friday night they're the sort of things that you know for maybe many other families we take for granted, but, you know, having that sort of feedback from a mum and dad, and obviously there's tears involved. I think we've got a lifetime supply of Kleenex in the clinic. Um, that That's the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning and, and wanting to rock into work and do my thing. And Natalie, what about you then? Well, What's the most rewarding part of being involved in research? What gets you out of bed in the morning? I think the, the research part is really being a, the ability to bring a novel treatment to a child and a family that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. So for me, that's a, a big motivation. And David? Um, yeah, so for me, I mean, I love seeing patients one-on-one, but what, what research offers is a chance to make an impact um, beyond just the sphere of the individual patients that I come in contact with, you know, potentially in the hundreds or thousands around the world, and that, that's a pretty amazing thought. Indeed. And, Honey? I think I'd agree with all of the above, including the comment from Peter about coffee. I think um, <laughs> the it, there's two reasons I got into this in Queensland. One was trying to get access for families to clinical trials that were being trialled around the world because I think that uh, access is really important. Two, I absolutely agree with David, is the one-on-one interactions and the, the sort of impact that a small increment of improvement in a particular domain like a child requesting something for the first time or something that has a massive impact on families at an individual level is really motivating, I think, from for me as well. But then uh, I absolutely agree with David, that additional layer of the research element that looks at a, a sort of more broader community impact, I think is really key. So, 
there's lots of reasons I get out of bed, coffee included, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and to you, Ted? Coffee is a major um, motivator, but uh, I, uh, I think all great comments from all the panel. I guess uh, from a young boy, I was very interested in how the mind worked, and I still am fascinated to learn more about it. And the fragile X is such a, a key gene in, in regulating the development of the brain. So it's always something, always something learning that I can learn that's new about the brain and how we're how we think and how the mind works is like the last frontier, me. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that, then, I'd like to pass back to Ted to thank everyone for joining and to thank the panel. Yes, we certainly appreciate your help, helping with this and participating. I think it's been a great evening, and I hope that this will be very informative for families that will be considering joining up for some of the trials that are coming along. So thanks very much. And I'd like to thank all the participants. Thank you, everyone. It's quite late during the week, but um, uh, I hope it's been uh, useful. And certainly the presentations will be put up on the website, et cetera, through social media next week sometime so that um, uh, lots of other people can, uh, can tune in. Um, and I'd just like to close um, by thanking again the sponsors, Inova Pharmaceuticals, who kindly provided an education grant which made uh, this webinar and the videoing possible. Mm -hmm.